know, what it boils down to is God's voice is, you know, the Bible says, the, I don't know if Karen mentioned this or not, I went out and went to the restroom, came back in, but uh, she said, uh, it says in Psalm 29, his voice shakes the wilderness. Do you know, God never intended for there ever to be any wilderness, desert, desolation places on this earth. He put Adam and Eve in a garden here. He, he intended, as they procreated, as things grew, for this thing to be a, this planet to be a garden, eventually. Amen. And that's where it's going to go to as he renews it uh, in the future as he begins to work, continues to work. But uh, God's voice, when he speaks, you know, it, the vibration aspect she's talking about, God's voice has movement in it. You know, scientists are coming to, a lot of scientists are coming to believe that everything materially in this earth, they've got this thing broken down to these quarks and these little particle things that they don't understand. And I've heard uh, credible scientists say, as best we can tell right now, everything in this world, this every tangible thing is made out of sound. Sound. Well, that makes sense. He upholds all things by the word of his power. They're catching up with the Bible. Hallelujah. Amen. And so what does that mean to us? Well, the Bible says God created man, mankind, men and women both, a living soul, it says in our Bible, in, in King James Version, it says. Uh, but, you know, some of the Jewish translations of that, the ancient translations, say he made man a speaking spirit. Now, you know, through evolution and all the humanistic teachings and stuff that's uh, infected our nation over the last 40, 50 years, they've tried to put us in the animal kingdom. You're just a higher form of a monkey. Well, your uncle may be a monkey, but mine's not. Amen. I've got a Father God. And the Bible says, hi, how you doing? Good to see you. Long time. <laughs> uh, I lost my train of thought there. I got distracted. <laughs> monkeys. Yeah, we're talking about monkeys. Yeah. Praise God. She can talk about the Beach Boys. I can talk about the monkeys. Amen. But uh, God, the Bible says that God is the Father of spirits. And Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.29 said that you and I are a spirit. We're made in the image of God, the Bible says. That it, the word image means likeness and kind. Amen. We're in his class. Glory. You know, there's different kinds of fish, but they're all in the same class. Right. They're all fish. Right. Well, you and I are in, created in the spirit class. Yeah. We're created in his image. Yes. And he's, he's uh, one God manifests in three persons, God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You and I are a triune being. We are a spirit. We have a soul, a mind, will, and emotions, and we live in a body. Amen. People struggle with that concept. I don't know why. Every time they pick up an egg and crack it, they're looking at a trinity. Do you know what egg's a trinity? It's one egg manifests in three parts, the yolk, the white, and the shell. And all three of those parts work together to make it an egg. And they taste good, too. Hallelujah. With a little salt and pepper on that scramble. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, you're going to get me off track here, Ron. Don't do that. But you and I are, we're spirit. We're in the spirit class. That's why the Bible, see, a speaking spirit. I mean, you know, animals have a certain level of communication and grunting and groaning. And, you know, people can teach a parrot to say words. That parrot, he's responding to uh, some kind of, I forget the, the term they use, but he's just basically mimicking something. He's trained to do that when a certain things happen. Amen? But you and I have been given a, something that no other being has even been given, and that is we've been given the right to speak words we choose from our heart. That's why Jesus said, guard your heart with all diligence, because out of it, Whatever comes out of your heart through your mouth is what you're going to have in your life. That's what he said. I didn't, it's not my idea. That's in the word. He even went so far as to say, if you believe in your heart, you speak to a mountain, believing in your heart, speaking with your mouth, the mountain will move. Amen? So you and I have been given that position 
And then when we got born again, after our spirit became illuminated and enlivened by the DNA of God. See, your, your spiritual DNA is the DNA of God. The blood of Jesus is not just some red substance dripping from a cross or laying on, a, on the mercy seat in heaven. It's a living, it's life. I don't even, I think, when I think of the blood now, I think, I've trained myself to think of life. Because that's what it is. It's alive. It says it's speaking in heaven. It's speaking, what's it speaking? Well, it's on the mercy seat, it's speaking mercy. Hallelujah. So you and I have been given the ability to allow God to speak through us. That's what the Holy Spirit was given to us for. God the Holy Spirit will anoint us, empower us. It says in Acts chapter 2 that they were all filled with the Spirit and they began to speak. They did the speaking as the Spirit gave them the utterance. They, it was their tongue, their mouth, their voice box, their lungs, but the words that came out of them were the words of God. Glory to God. So we've got to get a hold of this as the body of Christ. Yeah. The enemy wants us to <clears throat> not believe what it says in Proverbs, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Yeah. James taught about it. He said, your tongue is like a little fire. And he said, it's like a match, basically. And he said, if you light something with that match, it may be a little fire, may not be a big deal. That one little thing you say out of a wrong motive of your heart it may not be a big deal at the moment, just like a match is not a big deal, but how many of you know when it takes off and begins to consume and burn things, it becomes a big deal? He says it sets on fire the course or the wheel of nature. In other words, it, it sets on fire the things that happen in your life. And he says that in the world is set on fire of hell. There's three kinds of fire. There's the fire of God. There's natural fire that we warm our tootsies by in the, in the wintertime. And then there's the fires of hell, the destructive fires. And, he's, and, and James taught us, he says, make sure your tongue is used for the right purpose. He said it's like the helm on a ship, that little piece of wood back on those ships in those days. They had the sail. You've seen them all, you know. People go out on the Sea of Galilee when they go to Israel and they're on one of those ships. That little helm, just a little small part of that huge boat, but when you turn the helm, the whole boat turns. So the enemy wants to use your tongue. Amen. He wants to, see, he's looking for a way to express himself in this earth. And he can't just blast in here and do what he wants to do. He has to ha have permission. He, that's why he's always trying to possess somebody. He knows that you have to have a body on this earth to have authority on this earth. Did you ever notice that when people's spirits leave their bodies and they die physically, they lose their authority on this earth? That dead body just has to be put back in the ground and begin to disintegrate back into the dirt that it came out of. But the spirit goes to be with God, whoever, whatever your God is or whoever your God is. Amen? So the Lord is, and you know, I know some of us have heard this for years, but God is wanting us to understand that he can't just because of, now let me just go back here, all the way back. God is sovereign. Nobody tells God what to do. How many of you believe that's true? But in his sovereignty, when he says something or chooses something or establishes something, he stays with that forever. His word is eternal. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So once God created man and he established these principles that we're talking about in the word here, and he allowed the same laws that govern his being to govern our being, that's, a, that's the way it is. That's why he couldn't just step in when Adam and Eve, who had been given the governorship over this planet, God owns the planet, but God gave them the governorship. He gave them the right to administrate over it. When they turned around and let the devil in, God couldn't just blast in there and kick the devil in the teeth and run him off and start this thing again because he'd already said... This is the way it's going to be. That would have made him a liar. But he already knew they were going to do that. Just like he already knew you are going to do all the things you've done. And I've done all the things I've done. And how about that? He still loves you. He still saved you. 
He's still glad you're in his kingdom. You're in his family. Amen. Even though sometimes you wonder if you are or if you're worthy of it. Come on. Hallelujah. And so he began to work, of course, we know the plan of restoration and uh, the plan of bringing Jesus in and, and Jesus taking the punishment that we deserved, paying the price so that we could come back into the family and have the life and nature of God in us. Well, what good does it do to have the life of nature and God in you if it's not being used? When Jesus was ministering on the earth for three and a half years, he always said things that people had trouble with because he was prophetically speaking about spiritual truth now and into the future. The prophets are always thought to be nutcases until their prophecies start coming true. Amen. It's true. See, I, God's called me to a prophetic ministry. And I'm not saying that I know it all or that I can prophesy about everything. You can't. No prophet can do that. That's not even scriptural. We I'm not going to get off on that rabbit trail, but that's the truth. But right on the other hand, I know from experience in walking in what he's called me to walk in in over 30 years is that you live a, a, when you have that prophetic calling on your life, and we all in one sense have the same calling, but you live about half your life in the future. Yeah. Your thoughts are going out into places that you're not there yet. And when you talk about those things, if people don't think that way, if, all they're, done, if they're stuck in the now, and the sad part is many are stuck in the past. Some people spend more time thinking about the past that's dead and gone than they even do about now. And some people think all they're doing is trying, looking around now and seeing what's going on and trying to live their future out of what's happening now. It isn't about what's happening now or what happened then. It's about what God says is happening in the future. Follow Him. Follow what He said. Keep pursuing what He's showing you. Amen? And so many times uh, that happens with the prophetic. People reject it because it doesn't make sense now. And Jesus, you know, on, uh, when they had the Feast of Tabernacles, one of their seven redemptive feasts, they were celebrating. On the last day of that great feast, they, had, they did what they call the water libation, which is that whole that Feast of Tabernacles was a seven, eight-day feast of nothing but what we were just doing, praising and thanking God for the blessings of the last year, for the harvest, for the fact that he honored them on the Day of Atonement that was just a few days before. He covered their sins. He forgave their sins for another year. So they were praising, and it was a praise party for seven or eight days, thanking God. And then on the last day, they did this water libation thing where the priest went down and got water out of the stream, came up to the temple and poured water on the altar... And as the people praised him with these branches and these different uh, tree limbs and things that God had them get, they were all symbolic uh, prophetically of something. But the bottom line was they were asking God for another year of rain and blessing. Because they knew if Israel didn't get rain, they were in trouble. Amen? And Jesus stands up in the middle of all that water libation thing. He says, you need a little rain? Now, that's not exactly how he said it. That's the Pastor Purcell paraphrased edition of the Bible. You need some water? He said, come to me. I'll give you some living water. And he said, out of your belly or your spirit, your inner man, will flow rivers of living water. What Ezekiel showed you hundreds of years before when he saw the temple and he saw the water coming out from the, under the door of the temple and this river was so vast and so deep and wide that you could get out ankle deep and just splash around, get knee deep or hip deep or you can get all the way, get under, under the water to where the river takes you where you need to go. You don't try to go where you want the river to go. He said out, there's a flow comes out of you of living water. And it says there, it interprets it for us right there in the Gospel of John. It says that he was speaking of the Spirit which had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. When he went to the cross and died for our sins, paid the price so that the life and nature of God could come into us, the Holy Ghost came into us, and on the Feast of Weeks, on the Feast of Pentecost, Jesus said, I'm leaving, but you guys go and get in this room and wait on me because on that day and in that fullness of time, in that moment, I'm going to pour out my spirit. The Holy Ghost is going to come on you in power. And you're going to be able to be not just somebody who argues a doctrine with somebody. You're going to have living evidence of the fact that I am real and am alive. 
And everybody knows the story how when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. That's one of the secrets to seeing the Holy Ghost manifest himself. He doesn't manifest himself in, spirit, in, in an atmosphere of strife. James said where strife is, there's every evil work. There's confusion. Amen. You can always know where the devil's at because people are confused. Hallelujah. If you and I listen to him, we'll be confused too. Paul said God's not the author of confusion. Amen. So when we come into that unity and we love one another and we don't try to play God and figure each other out all the time and wonder why everybody's not as good as we are or something. Amen. I'm not saying we don't hold fast to the basic doctrines of Christ and the blood and repentance and so forth. But at the same time, when we walk in love in the church with one another, we're in that one accord. There's an atmosphere where the Holy Ghost can manifest itself. If it's in your home, he'll manifest himself in your home. If it's in your business, he'll manifest himself in your business. Hallelujah. Some people need to come into unity and one accord with themselves. It's true. There's some people that are, and I've been there. I know that. They've been divi they're divided against themselves. They, they, they judge themselves wrongly. How do I do that, Pastor? Well, you don't believe what God said about you. He said he gave you the free gift of righteousness and cleansed you from all sin. And if you're still saying I'm unworthy or I'm not, uh, you know, and you live in this guilt of not being good enough, you're divided against yourself. Because you're saying what God did at the cross is not, not enough for you. God got on me years and years ago about that because I, I was doing that whole thing. And one day he told me, he said, John, who's smarter, you or me? He has to talk to me, you know. I said, well, you are. He says, do I know everything? I said, yeah. He says, what do I say in my word about you? Well, you said you've made me in right standing. You have given me the gift of right standing with you. you he who knew no sin, Jesus, was made to be sin for me that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. When I accepted him, I stepped into right standing with him the same standing he has with you, I have with you. That's, that's what the Bible says. People are always trying to do better and be more holy. You can't do that. You're going to be one frustrated Christian and probably eventually give up the struggle and just go, I quit, I can't do this. That's part of what happened to me when I was young. That's why I ran from the call of God for 16 years, because a lot of that stuff I had messed up in my head. But when you understand that the only way you can be more like him is being in his presence, what does the Bible say? It says, as we look into the face of Jesus, we are transformed from one level of glory to the next. If you will hang out with Jesus, you'll be, be, begin to become like him. And you'll begin to, be, to know things you don't know right now. Amen. You'll begin to see things from his perspective. Yeah. Come on, are you here? Yeah. What's the title of this message? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Psalm 117. Last, beginning of this last year, the Lord spoke to me and said, this is a year... Of, this is a Psalm 117 year. Yeah. I know this is 2017. And I'm not one of these people that, you know, try to look for, you know, try to put the numbers together in my head and say, well, this is it, you know. But the Lord spoke to my heart and he told me because, uh, and I think I, he, you know, he's, he elaborated on things since then. Everybody in this room, everybody on this planet, as a matter of fact, is in transition right now, yes. is in the process of shifting spiritually into a different spiritual season. There are spiritual seasons just like there are natural seasons. <laughs> Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because they didn't know the signs of the times. He said, you guys can look at the sky and tell me whether it will rain tomorrow or not. You can tell the future tomorrow by the sky but you, here you are, the spiritual leaders of Israel, and you can't tell what spiritual season you're in. They were standing there looking at God in the flesh in the eyes and didn't even know he was God. Right. 
See, we can have, I mean, you can have God right there. He hides in plain sight. Because you'll only find him if your heart really wants to know him and find him. That's true. If, if you really want to know him, is there a God and is he real? And, you know, is this stuff what, it's, what the Bible says it is? And if he's God, then I want to walk with him and I want to, you know, cooperate with him and let him be God. My, if you really want to do that and you begin to pursue him by reading his word and praying and just obeying what you know in your heart to do, you'll find him. You won't find just a bunch of principles to live by. People that, never know, that don't know God live by good principles and have success. The Bible says the hand of the diligent will bear rule. People that are diligent in their jobs, diligent to go to school and get an education, diligent to pursue things, they end up ruling. They end up prospering. Right. You know, that's why David, why do the wicked prosper? Because they're diligent. Right. But that doesn't mean they know God. Amen. Come on, are you here? Jesus in Revelation talked about the Laodicean church, which was a church existed then, but it was also a church, uh, the 7,000 year, uh, 1,000 year periods or the seven days uh, that this earth is, is going to be in its state that it is now until there's a change. That last church, that seventh church, the Laodicean church, that last church age, he said it's going to be full of people that think they've got it because they, their natural life's okay. And he said, but what you don't understand is you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. You don't have the garment of salvation. You're spiritually blind. You aren't seeing things from God's perspective. You're trying to figure it all out in your head. Right. Amen. Amen. And he says, because of that, you're, you're, you're spiritually poor. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? So our outward situation many times has absolutely nothing to do with the spiritual right. truth. So Jesus said to these Pharisees and these, these uh, people there that were in, in rulership in Israel, he said, you can't tell me, you, you don't see the signs of the times. That word times in the Greek is the word, uh, I just lost it, kairos. Kairos. Kairos means that which time allows you to do. In other words, there's a will of God for my life right now. There's something he wants me to be, wants me to do, wants me to say, wants me to walk in. God sees me more than I can understand myself, and he's saying, here's who you are, and here's what I want you to do. And this is what will bless your life and cause you to be a blessing to others. Yes. Well, he, he said to these Pharisees, you guys don't know the spiritual season. If you did, you'd know who I am, because it's a season for me to be here and do what I'm doing. But see, that's why people, that people criticize the move of God because they look at it from the outside. Well, this is not the way we did it in Grandma's church. Right. Well, maybe it was a different season. Maybe it was that God was doing things. You know, he was emphasizing certain things in that church to reestablish that in the body of Christ because it had been lost. Now he's shifting seasons and he's emphasizing something else and he's moving into something. Yeah. Come on, are you here? Yeah. So we have to stay teachable. I'm not saying that we just buy anything anybody says about a season. You need to prove things out. Right. And see, if you walk with God, if you're really a disciple, you will be aware of certain things. You won't know everything, but you will be aware of certain things, and you'll pick up on when somebody says something, you'll pick up on it. Oh, wait, that's what the Lord's been talking to me about. The Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let it be established. Yeah. Amen? Hallelujah. I preached the message here a couple of Sunday nights ago about discipleship. Look at your neighbor and say discipleship. You can say it. You won't choke on it. Hallelujah. Jesus said some pretty radical things about discipleship. Now, there's a difference in being a child of God and being in his family and being a disciple. The very word itself expresses maturity. You know, when you're born, your mom and dad do everything for you. They change your pampers. They feed you. Amen. They understand you're a little kid. You're going to cry all the time or if, you don't, you know, if you're not satisfied or whatever. And they, they understand that and they just carry you around, take care of you, they feed you milk. They don't try to feed you steak because you'll choke to death. Amen. 
And in the scriptures, we're told if you're a new Christian, desire the sincere milk of the word. God will feed you. He'll, you know, he'll nurture you and nourish you as a new babe in Christ. But there comes a place where God says, okay, now it's growing up time. Because if you're ever going to walk in full maturity spiritually and be able to handle things that go on on this earth and be able to be what I've called you to be and live the life I have for you, you're going to have to become a disciple. There's going to have to come some discipline to your life to keep your spirit, to keep your soul and your body from dominating your spirit through the deception of the enemy and leading you off in a primrose pathway that ends in death. Amen. And Jesus said this. I don't have time to look the scriptures up this morning. But he said this. If you don't love me more than anybody, mother, father, sister, brother, anybody in this world, if you don't love me more than you love them, he, he said this. You cannot be. My disciple. Didn't say you weren't one of my children. Didn't say you weren't in my kingdom. Many Christians live and die and never get out of the stage of babyhood spiritually. You can sit in church every Sunday, be 65 years old like me, and still be a baby. And you know how we can tell? When we take your pacifier away from you, you go nuts. Come on. The people that are always in strife with other people in the church, they're babies. They get mad when you tell them that. Just like I got mad when they told me that. But you see, if you're ever going to grow, you've got to be willing to be honest before God. I ask God a question. God, where am I messed up, Lord? Where is my thinking messed up? Correct me. I need correction. I don't want to run off in pride and think, I know this and that and who, who, blah, blah, blah. And be this big fool. There's a lot of deceived Christians that are full of pride. I've been one, I know. And I'm not saying I don't have trouble with that now. Sometimes I do. But I try to watch myself. I try to say, God, uh, you know, show me. Correct me. Like this one preacher one time, he, you know, he, he thought that, those of us that believe in some of the things we've talked about this morning, that that was just extremism. And so he had some people in his church that believed in that. And he said, I'm going I'm to straighten these people out, you know. And so he, he said, but I knew better than to just confront them without reading the books that they've been reading and some of this stuff so that I knew where they were coming from. So he said, I started reading some of these books. And he said, after a while reading these books, he said, I came to the conclusion that they knew God better than I did. And he said, I, he said, I'm sitting there at my desk, and I said, God, where else am I deceived in my life? And he said, I heard a truck backing up. Beep, 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 a dump truck. I love it when God tells me I'm wrong. Because you know why? He doesn't leave me wrong. You can say, well, what's right? And he'll start showing you what's right. There is, the Bible says, there is a way that seems right to a man. But the end thereof is death. See, I don't read the Bible because I'm trying to earn points with God. I read the Bible because I need the Holy Spirit to interpret the, the book of life to me so I can walk in life. I need to hear his voice every day. I need him to give me revelation. I need him to comfort me. Correct me. Do what I want to be a disciple. Because Jesus also said, he said, if you're a disciple, indeed, you'll know the truth. <clears throat> Just because you're born again doesn't mean you know the truth about every area in your life and everything about your life and everything about your future. It's true. You'll know the truth. And now listen, and that word know means you'll become one with the truth. See, it's, it's one thing to have a mental concept about, like for instance, if I said, the Bible says by his stripes we're healed. People go, yeah, okay, I can see that. You know, his blood, the stripes on his back, the price was paid for healing for me. But you can know that's true and not be one with it. Amen. Jesus didn't say, if you, know, if you understand something in your head and you say it out of your mouth, you'll have it in your life. We can understand concepts, principles with our head. He said, if you believe it in your heart. 
He says, I will write my words on their heart. There's a process where information that comes in through our five physical senses, if we are meditating on it and receiving it spiritually and our heart is open, it actually begins to become part of us. You will know truth. Jesus said, Father, your word is truth. And then that truth begins to flow out of your spirit through your mouth and into your life through your belief system and walking with God. And freedom begins to come to you in every area of your life. See, one of the problems in America, we've created a spiritual culture of pretending things are okay when they're not. How many of you found, up, found out after you got born again, even though you were full of the joy of the Lord and excited and going to win the whole world for Jesus in about two weeks, that you still had some messed up areas in your life? Amen. We, we need to be honest. With, yeah, be, be, be. <laughs> See, the Lord, he knew what he was getting when he got you. He's not upset because you're a human and you're, you know, you've let some things, some habits develop or, or some kind of thinking that's in your head that's wrong. But what he's saying is, if you want to get free from what that produces in your life. See, if you want to get free from what it is that's producing depression in your life. God's not out to trim the tree. That's why many times we ask him for help and we don't get the, the, the tree trimming help right away. Right. The fruit is still there. The manifestation outwardly is still there. Yeah. But what he'll do if you'll walk with him in that is he'll take you, he'll go and he'll get his axe and he'll go down and he'll dig around in your life and expose the root that's producing the fruit and he'll cut that thing off and then you won't have to have another tree trimming process another six months down the road. Yeah. This thing will be gone. The truth will set you free. free. Hallelujah. And until we get in the, the perfect image of Jesus, he's going to continue to set us free. Now, it's not always about something that's sin. It could be. Or it just could be some lie we've believed about ourselves or about other people or about God. Hallelujah. Boy, I've been trying to get to this Psalm 117. See, this is where we're at. We're moving into a time. We're in, into a time, just like Jesus saying to the Pharisees, you don't know what spiritual season you're in. Then he went around for three and a half years and demonstrated the season. Right. And the very people that should have been his greatest supporters, right. even his own home synagogue, right. he went to preach in his own home synagogue, and he made true statements about the season. And because they didn't get the season, they got so mad, they tried to throw him off a cliff. They tried to throw God off a cliff. So when people don't get you, don't worry about it. Just make sure you're accurate. You know, you're walking with the Lord and you're listening to him. Jesus said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you too. Why? Because there were people that didn't get it. They were as religious as the day is long, but they didn't get it. Right. Yeah. Amen? Because it's not about being religious. Yeah. It's about relationship. Yeah. It's about being in the family and letting the Father teach you, letting the Father, interacting with the Father, going before Him, having a conversation with Him. We've turned prayer into some religious mess too. You know what prayer is? It's you talking to God and letting him talk to you. Yeah. It's not a one-way conversation. It's not, my name's Jimmy, gimme, gimme, gimme. Yeah. See you later, God. I put my order in, you know. I'll be back later to have my Big Mac and whatever else I want. It's about you listening to him. Because sometimes he has to show you what you really need, not what you... If he gave you what you wanted, about two weeks down the road, you'd be saying, oh my God, what did I ask for that for? Come on. But as you walk with him, then he starts working in you, preparing you. You know, if you're single and you're wanting a spouse, don't ask God for a spouse. 
I'm not saying you can't say, Lord, I'd like to be married, and I thank you that you provide someone in my life like that. But don't start pushing God for a spouse. You get with God and let him make you a spouse. Because sometimes he's not going to give you to somebody so their life will be cursed with you. I'm not, no, I'm not, it's true. If there's stuff in you that's going to mess up the marriage, he's not going to put you in that situation and let you mess somebody else's life up. He's going to turn you into a husband or a wife. He's going to deal with you and get you lined up so that when you come into that covenant of marriage, you're going to be a blessing to that other person and help edify them and lift them up. You're not going to be, you know, the, the, the one that's judgmental and pointing out, you know, you're going to understand these things and your marriage can be blessed. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Have you ever pressed God enough that he gave you something you wanted and then you found out you didn't want it? That happened to Israel. We want a king. Samuel goes to God and says, they said they want a king. He said, tell them they already got one. Yeah. See, we got things we don't even know already. I'm their king. If they'll listen to me, I'll, I'll be like a king to them. And man, I'll tell you what, you can't find a better king than God. He's not some kind of egotistical, you know, uh, dominator that's selfish. That it's all about him. Amen. And so you know the story, how they kept pressing, no, we want a king, we want a king. So God says, okay. I've, I've done that in my life at times. He finally let me have, have it. You know why? Because that was the only way I was going to learn I didn't want it. I wouldn't listen to him. I'm too smart for him. Oh, no, 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 I need this. I need this. I got to have this. I got to have this. Really? Oh, John, no, you don't, don't need that right now. No, but I want it now. Right. I want it, I want it, I want it. So he says, okay, you can have it for a while. And then you're like, oh, God, what did I do that for? But you learn a lesson. They learned a lesson with King Saul. Do you know God never referred to him as king? He only referred to him as captain because that wasn't his king. He had another guy out hanging out with a sheep, playing on his harp. That was the one he knew was king, going to be king. Amen? So that's another lesson. Sometimes what you call things is not what God calls them. Hallelujah. I hope this is helping this morning. So God is always, you know, this pathway of life is crooked. It's the, the enemies here. See, if he can't get you to stop, then he'll try to get you to go too fast and get ahead of God. If he can't get you to do that, then he'll try to make you, you know, he'll try to deceive you and say you need to zig when God says zag. Exactly. You need to go left when God's saying go right. right. But the Bible says that God will take the crooked ways and make them straight. Yeah. When you follow God, he leads you straight into what he has for you in your life. And he's a good God, so what he's got for you is good. It's not always comfortable. It's not always easy. Come on, sometimes it stretches you. But that's how he gets the spirit of fear out of your life, so you don't have to run around being tormented by the spirit of fear. Because once you find out that when you obey him, and maybe your knees are knocking and having fellowship with one another in doing what he said, but then you see God show up and do what he said he'd do, all of a sudden there's a little lion that kind of starts rising up in you. You start getting a little more bold in your faith. And if you keep going down that pathway, the next thing you know, there's nothing that's going to cause you to pull back or shrink back in fear. If you hear God and if he leads you into it, you know you can boldly do it, not arrogantly, but boldly do it, and God will perform and do what he said he'd do. See, it's his, it's his will for you to be bold. Well, I'm just bashful. No, you're not. You're full of fear. I understand that because I grew up thinking I was a second-class citizen. I got that in my head somehow when I was a kid. I got it in my head that I wasn't as good as anybody else. I got it in my head that I can't, I won't, I shouldn't, I wouldn't. And I lived in torment until I was well into my adulthood. And finally, one day, the Lord came. I won't tell you the whole story, but he dealt with me about that, that that was in my life, and he made me confront that Goliath. And believe me, it was like confronting a Goliath. It looked like this dude is way too big to hit. God says, no, he's way too big to miss. 
Isn't it good when God wants you to throw a rock at a giant? He gives you a big target. Hallelujah. <laughs> Looks bigger than you can handle. And so as I listened to him, he took that, he ripped that fear out of my life. He started setting me free from that fear. Praise God. And when he starts setting you, because see, your identity is not wrapped in fear. He told me one day, I was walking down that hallway right there, walking toward the, the sanctuary, and I had a fearful emotion, a fearful thought. He was, it was in the process of him dealing with this in my life, and I, I just immediately, my brain, because the tracks in my brain had been, had been renewed over the years to just see me and fear as one. It was like part of my personality as far as I was concerned. It was who I was. And I immediately thought, oh, that's just me. And I mean, I heard the Holy Ghost. Don't tell me God doesn't speak today. I heard him loud and clear on the inside of me where he lives. He said, no, that's not you. That's not how I created you. That's you under the influence of the spirit of fear. And so I'm kind of like standing there going like, ooh. And I said, well, show me. How, and he began to show me how to differentiate the two. And then how to deal with it. Isaiah 54 is filled with instructions on how to deal with the spirit of fear. What are we talking about this morning? I don't know. No, it's Psalm 117, yeah. And we're talking about discipleship. We're talking about, listen, now listen to me. I know this is true. We are coming into a time where as God shifts the earth and aligns natural governments aligns things in the earth, aligns things in the spirit realm for his, the next thing that, that's going to happen on planet earth, the next season, what's it going to be? It's going to be his kingdom on earth for the thousand year reign. Oh, that's, right. oh. that's where we're moving into. That's what we're starting to get the, because see in seasons, in transition seasons, we have two of them in the natural realm. We have fall and we have spring. And in those two transition seasons, you get a little bit of the season that was and a little bit of the season that's coming. In the spring, you get up one day, and it's like, oh, man, it's almost like winter again. I'm cold. Got to put my coat on today. Then the next day, you get up, and it's, man, it's warm. This feels like summer. Is summer here already? No, you're just in transition. You're leaving one, going into another. And there's this kind of splashover that happens in that time. And so God is preparing us, if we'll listen to him, to come into that kingdom season, and he's going to show us, because, see, when he comes as king, he comes in and he grabs hold of what belongs to him and he shifts it into line. So you're going to see a lot of shifting. You're going to see a lot. Of, we've already seen a lot of people that were in leadership for many years as presidents and, and so forth of nations come crashing down. And we've seen turmoil in that nation. And people just look at that and go, oh, my God, the world's going to blow up. No, the world's going to shift. The demons that have been dominating nations and dominating people and even dominating us in our lives, God's coming and saying, if you'll let me be king in your life, I'm going to send my angels, I'm going to send my spirit, I'm, going to, I'm the Lord of hosts. He started teaching me about this in 2010. I'm the Lord of armies and I am going to go take back what belongs to me and I'm going to kick the devil out and purge things out and set things up so that I can bring you into the fullness of what I have for you. Because before Jesus returns, the church, the ecclesia, will be a glorious church. What does that mean? We will look like, act like, speak like, and be like Jesus. Well, Pastor, I think you've really gone over the edge now. You don't know me very well. I don't want to know you very well in that way. You know what I'm talking about? I don't have to know you very well. I know God very well. And I know when he says this is what's going to happen, that's what's going to happen. So he's giving us a choice. Get in, get out, or get run over. I'm telling you, God's shifting our nation back to the godly foundations that we were born in. Now you may say, well, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican. I la, 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 la. You can get caught up in all of that. And there's nothing wrong with standing up for something you think is socially right or whatever. But just make sure it's biblically right before you think it's socially right. Amen? Amen. He's shifting us back to that, and you watch what I'm telling you. The people that f try to fight against that and the people he wants to use to do that, they are going to go down in flames. I don't rejoice in that. 
But you, when God says, this is it, we've come to a fullness of time, we're now going to move this way, you don't want to step up in front of God and start resisting Him and telling Him, you're not going to do this. And see, we can do it. We can do it sometimes. When we try to figure our life out up here only with this little peanut brain and minuscule information, and we don't get over into the mind of Christ and let God rev give us revelation like he did Peter. Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Who do, who do the peanut brains think I am? <laughs> they say, well, they say you're Elijah raised from the dead, and they say, you're see, all this speculation stuff. He says, who do you say I am? Peter says, ha, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're that King Messiah we've been praying for. Yes. You're that one. Even though they taught us you'd come in on a white horse and kick the Romans out and all this other stuff, yeah. and that isn't the way it's happened, but you are him. And Jesus said, Peter, you're it says blessed in the King James, but there's many uh, Greek words and Hebrew words that mean blessed, that mean something different. And when Jesus said you're blessed, what he said to Peter in the Greek was you are manifesting the characteristics of God. You've tapped into the flow of God and the revelatory understanding of God, and you're seeing things through God's eyes, and that's why you know who I am. You're not one of the peanut brains just trying to live out of your head. Yeah. Usually, the fresh new move of God in the earth, the biggest opponents of that is the old move of God. Because usually the old move of God, once it's over, people don't want it to be over, and so they, they try to hang on to something that's dead and gone and over with, and it becomes a religious form, a legalistic religious form of what was, and, it, and they end up being an old wineskin, and when they see new wineskins, they start fighting against that. Jesus even said it himself. He said, when you serve the wine, he says, some people will say, I don't want that new wine, the old is better. Come on. But it's not better. Right. Now, some of this may be Greek to you. You may think I'm speaking in some kind of Christian code here this morning. And uh, to some, I may be. Because, and I'm not there again. I say this in love. Jesus said, there are people who don't have ears to hear. what the Spirit, They hear the words, but they walk out going, what was that about? I didn't understand that. Did you get that? Honey, did you get that? I didn't get that. He, Jesus said, here's why. Their heart's hard. They haven't opened the doors of their heart and said, God, I want your will in my life. I want to be yours. I want to be your disciple. I want to follow you. When I get to the end of my life, I want to be able to say like Jesus did, I glorified you, Father, on this earth. In other words, you were able to speak through me, walk through me, minister through me, Cause me to live for the very destiny and purpose you created me to be. Now, the enemy of your soul, I don't know how he knows these things, but he starts on you when you're a kid. And he starts trying to convince you that you can be anything but what God wants you to be. As I grew up, I look back at a lot of the mind attack and a lot of the stuff that even happened in my life was there to to put to me or, or present to me or convince me that I could be anything but a minister. Right. And I even remember when God called me. When I was 16 years old, I was praying one night, and he called me, and I went, me? And immediately my brain kicked in because the devil had programmed my mind to think a certain way. Yep. He had renewed my mind. And I remember thinking, well, I can't be that, because that, that, I had this misconcept of what ministry was. I had this misconcept of what this was all about. Instead of just saying, well, God knows what he's talking about, you're going to have to help me, Lord. It, uh, to me, it doesn't even look like I qualify. But then one day I read that scripture. It says he, he calls the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And I thought, well, maybe I do qualify. He couldn't use Moses until Moses thought he couldn't do anything. When he was 40 years old and out murdering people to try to fulfill the will of God in his life, and a lot of Christians are doing that. They're like Peter. They, they're deceived in what's going on. They're over cutting people's ears off and think they're doing God a service. You're only strong in him when you're weak in you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
Amen. So what is it? It's about humility. It's about saying, Lord, every day I humble myself under your mighty hand. What does the Bible say? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due season. The right spiritual season, the right time. He'll bring you up into. See, he has to prepare you, has to teach you, he has to get you to that place. Some of you are in here and you're ready to step into a new place. But you're going to have to get with God. Get away from your TV for a little bit. I, I'm not trying to put some trip on, your, you know, on you about how much time you have to spend with God. That's not none of my business. That's between you and Him. But I will tell you this. You wouldn't go to your job if you work for a company. You wouldn't go to your job and never listen to what the boss said of what he wants done on, this, on the place. You just go out and try to do it on your own. You're going to end up getting fired or messing up the company or something. But you meet with somebody usually or you're, there's some kind of an information flow so that you know how to do what's right to cooperate with what's happening in the company. Yeah. It's the same thing in the kingdom. Yes. Amen. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to spend time with God. You'll have time to lay in a sick bed. You'll have time to sit at the divorce lawyer. You'll have time to spend half your money and have a messed up life for years because you didn't listen to God and let him change things in you so he could change things around you. Now listen, that's just the truth. I'm not putting anybody down that's been divorced or anybody that's sick. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is don't tell me you don't have time. It's what you prioritize in your life. You have time for everything you think is important in your life. If you like to eat ice cream like me, you make sure there's ice cream in the house. Hallelujah. And every night about 7 o'clock or so, something just the spirit comes over you. Called Rocky Road. Come on. Come on. Boy, they're getting excited now. We're talking about rock and roll. Good. Hallelujah. What we think is important, we have time for. And if you've got a, you know, maybe you've got kids and you've got a job and you've got, you know, you're like almost 24 hours a day and all that kind of thing, give God two minutes. Plant a seed. God, all I've got is between the house and work. And so I'm, I'm giving that to you. I'm, instead of me listening to blab, blab on the radio or whatever, I'm going to worship and praise you all the way to work, and I'm going to ask you to fellowship with me. You're planting a seed. When you plant a seed, it starts growing. And before you know it, you'll have probably more time to spend with God than you know what to do with. Amen. Glory to God. Did you find Psalm 117 yet? Hallelujah. Let me read it, and I'm going to wind this up. We're going to have communion together. Psalm 117, two verses. He said this year, O praise, now the word praise there is halal. It means shine, to boast, to rave, to celebrate. Have you ever noticed the devil has raves? Remember people used to go to, I don't know if they still do that or not. They call them raves. Oh, that's, that's scriptural. It's just they were raving about the wrong thing. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. See, why, why does the enemy always want to shut down the celebration of God? Because the Bible says he inhabits our praises. Yes. You heard Karen talking about it earlier. Jesus said, pray, your will be done. What's the will of God? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's God's will for what is happening in heaven to happen on earth. Why? Because heaven is filled with God's presence. And every person I've ever heard of that's died, <clears throat> maybe been dead for an hour, went to heaven, come back, all these testimonies I've heard, down, they've always said the same thing. Heaven is full, filled with music and praise. Because you and I were created. Matter of fact, if you study the devil when he was Lucifer, which means light bearer, it, if you study him in, in the Hebrew words, he had musical instruments built into his being. 
He didn't have to have a drum. He was a drum. He didn't have to have a harp. He was a harp. When he moved in his being, praise and worship, <clears throat> he was the worship leader of heaven. He was the one that was in charge of making sure that the angels and the beings in heaven were always in connection with God so that God could inhabit. That word inhabit in the, in the Psalms means he sets down or he rules or he manifests everything he is and he's good and his, he's healing. He's, he's all of these things. You, got, you want your problems solved, get in his presence. There were probably people healed this morning as we praised him. Some of you know, sometimes you, you have pain in your body and you just kind of overlook it to where you don't even notice it. I've had people do that. They get home, they go, you know what? My back got healed and I didn't even know it. Amen. And nobody laid hands on it. Laying on of hands is okay. But getting in his presence is where it's at. Amen. And see, in order for us to shift into that kingdom age, we're going to have to praise our way into it. Because we, I can't go into it. I don't know how to get there. Yeah. And you don't either. Right. Now, you can sit around with everybody else and wring your hands and go, Oh, my God, the world's falling apart. Oh, no, what's going to happen? I'll tell you what's going to happen. God's going to shake the devil's kingdom apart and the people that the devil's been using to dominate in this earth in it, and he's going to establish his kingdom in the place. Yeah. And there are things going to be uprooted. And there are things that are going to be torn down. And there are things that are going to be removed. God told the children of Israel under Joshua, when you go into that land, I command you to tear out every idol. I command you to get rid of their pictures. I, he said, you get rid of everything that would cause you to be distracted away from me because if you don't, you'll end up going back and following that. I only want you to see me and worship me. And that's the way it's got to be. So it says... Boast, shine, rave, celebrate, praise the Lord. All ye nations, people groups, praise Him. That word praise there, the original word, means to properly address with a loud tone. God, you are God. I worship you. I praise you. I acknowledge you as God. See, when you do that, oh, that person's just kind of fanatical. They're just excited. They're emotional. <laughs> well, emotions by themselves can be fickle. If you live your life by how you feel emotionally every day, you're going to live on a roller coaster. And, you know, you can get be on a roller coaster for a couple of minutes, but if you stay on too long, you're going to end up throwing up. You're going to end up feeling bad. Amen? So emotions by themselves, you're right. But who created emotions? So if he created it, it must be good. If it's used in the right place for the right purpose. And when he says, man, just open up and let me have it. Exalt me. It's not just emotion. It's emotional expressed from here. Lord, I love you. I thank you for who you are. I minister to you. See, because we're, we're priests on this earth. Priests minister to the Lord on behalf of the earth. As we praise and worship him, we connect with him. He comes down. He's inhabit, he inhabits our praises. And he begins to shift everything in this earth to align with heaven's will. When you're home and... You know, all problems are happening and this is threatening and you're going, maybe you lose your job. Whatever the thing is, the best thing you could do is just stop right there and say, Father, I praise you. I praise you over that threat on my life that I might lose my job. I praise you over my kids that are being rebellious. I praise you over, because see, we have authority. God has given us a realm of dominion. And my kids, even though my sons are grown and my grandkids are here and all that, there's still an element of authority I have because they're my seed. And Psalm 112 says that the seed of a righteous man will be mighty warriors, spiritual warriors in the earth. So I can, pray, I can tell the devil, take a hike. You take your hands off of my grandkids in Jesus' name. I can, even though the enemy comes, I can tell him that. I can praise over them. I can pray. I can say, God, give me their destiny so I can prophesy it out into the air so that it, it's there for them. What does the devil want you to do? Oh, my God, what's going to happen? Oh, no. oh, no, I remember my grandma did that, they, and they're, now they're doing it. Oh, no, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Come on, are you here? 
This is the truth. God has not given us a spirit of fear. If you've got a spirit of fear like I had, running my mind, you didn't get it from God. He's given you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. I have a hard time walking in love. You need to walk in the spirit. Go by what you know in your spirit, not what your head's thinking and your emotions are telling you. I'm just like you. I was watching something on, online last night, and I saw these kids beating up these other smaller kids. And the first thing I want to do is, oh, man, I wish I was there. Because <laughs> one thing that really gets to me is when I see people picking on some person that can't defend themselves. But after a minute or two, I said, Lord, forgive me. Your vengeance is yours. You'll repay Plus, it was a bunch of young, dumb kids that probably didn't know how to walk in life. Well, I knew they didn't from what they were acting and saying. So, God, I pray that you'll help every one of those young men find their destiny. God, I pray in Jesus' name that your spirit would dog their steps. I pray that the angels will come and visit them. I pray that you'll lead them to Christian people that will help them, bring them into their destiny. Walking in love is a choice. It's not a feeling. He's given us power, love, and what? A sound mind. What does that mean? You're just that you're not just going crazy? No, that means the mind of Christ. First Corinthians chapter two is yours. Jesus is so in you, you're so one with him, he will let you, he will let you have him think through your mind. He will give you his thoughts. Isaiah fifty five, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts and ways more superior to your thoughts and ways. But, he says, as the rain and snow falls on the earth and waters the earth and causes the seed to bring forth and to bring forth bud and to give bread to the eater and seed to the sower, so are my words. He will give you words that will cause your mind to be sound, your heart to be unified with His purpose and His word. And as you begin to speak those, as you begin to pray those, as you begin to live those, then what He has desired and what He wills will come to pass in your life. Well, the Lord's just sovereign, you know, whatever He wants to do. That's a lie from hell. He is sovereign, but once He has laid down the law, once He has laid down His word and said, this is the way it is, Amen. That's the way it's going to be if you believe it and walk with him in it. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. Why? Verse 2. For his merciful kindness. Covenant kindness is another way of saying it. Merciful kindness. Mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is what God will do for you because of what the devil has done against you. Grace is God's attitude toward us. He favors us. He favored you before you were saved. Now, he couldn't work in your life in some areas because you had the wall up against him because you were in a spiritual agreement with the enemy. And you were going, and, and even as a Christian, if you get, let yourself get offended and stay offended... You will be walking in blindness of pride and you will, the door is open for the enemy to deceive you and you will, everywhere you go, it'll be a mess. Eventually. And you'll probably blame other Christians or blame somebody else or or that was the last pastor from the church I went to or whatever. But it's not, it's you. You're walking in darkness. And you need to get honest with yourself, with God. And get before him and say, God, Take me apart and put me back together again, whatever I need. My life didn't change until I did that. And it wasn't easy because I just knew Karen was the problem. (laughs) My marriage was the way it was because of her. And it wasn't because of her. It was because of me. People are always wanting to mow somebody else's backyard. Get your own mowed first, would you? Get that log out of your eye, and then you might be able to see a little speck in somebody else's eye. 
But as long as you got this log hanging out of your eye, you ain't going to see anything. Hallelujah. I love you, Lord. Now, why is he saying to praise him? Because he comes in. And when he comes in and he inhabits, his, his presence changes you. You begin to line up with him. You begin to see things about him you didn't see. You begin to see things about the devil you didn't see. You begin to see things about yourself you didn't see. And then you can rejoice and enter into that and things begin to change because his merciful kindness, it wants to come to you if you'll praise him, is great toward us and the truth of the Lord endures forever. So what do we do? Praise ye the Lord. It's so simple, we've missed it. See, God is very intricate and complicated beyond understanding, but he doesn't deal with us that way. He makes it palatable. And it's so, it's so simple and so palatable, sometimes it, it seems ridiculous to us. You mean, you're telling me, preacher, all I got to do every day is just lift my hands or lift my heart to God and say, I praise you, Lord. I don't understand my life, but I praise you because you're God and you know how to fix my life and you know how to be what you need to be in my life and you know how to show me to be what you call me to be. See, all these people that are running around spending money, using drugs, having sex, doing all the things they're doing, trying to find peace, trying to get to the, be, be the king at the top of the hill so that they can be famous, and they get up there and they go, ugh. Now I've got to use heroin the rest of my life to try to survive. That's, it's true. I was reading a thing online yesterday, some actor, singer, whatever he was, I, I don't remember for sure. He was saying, everybody I know is using heroin. You're never going to find peace outside of God. You never, ever, 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 ever. When you get honest with yourself that there's not peace in here, and you say, God, there's, I don't have peace. When I was 29 years old, I had my own business. I had a bass boat to go fishing with. Hallelujah. I had a wonderful wife that I didn't think was a wonderful wife. I had two sons, two beautiful children. The American dream. But inside, I had no peace. And because I wasn't happy, you know, have you heard the old saying about happy, happy wife, happy life? Well, it goes the other way, too. Because I wasn't happy. I was making everybody else unhappy around me. And the devil was deceiving me, pulling me into destruction. I would not have lived my whole life out. God told me that. He told me one day, sitting in my work truck, when he was confronting me about this at 29 years old, when I finally opened up and admitted, I need truth, I need help. And truth, that's how you get help. He told me, he said, you're at a fork in the road spiritually. You've been young and immature, and I've covered you, but he said, I cannot cover you anymore because you know you need to follow me, and you're not doing it. He didn't say anything about my call or any of the, the stuff that I already knew. He addressed the issue that needed to be addressed right then. And he showed me that the enemy's plan and his plan, it was like a fork in the road. And he told me, he said, if you would have, later on he told me, if you would have followed the wrong thing, you would have walked off in the darkness and you would have died at a young age and missed your destiny on earth. But Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Don't make, this is not a game. The enemy wants to kill you. He can't just blast in and do it. But if he can, if you let him deceive you long enough, you'll commit suicide spiritually. You'll walk into death willingly and don't even know you're doing it. Well, you're just trying to scare us. Absolutely. I'm trying to scare the hell out of you. Yeah, that's right. And scare heaven into you. Sometimes that's what we need. The Bible says some save with fear. doesn't say everybody gets saved that way. I got saved that way. When I was a child, I was afraid of hell. Didn't take, I didn't have to have a bigger than a peanut brain to figure that one out. Hallelujah. But the bottom line is, we're in a time now where we're shifting into some things. And the devil is, that's why he's throwing a fit right now. It's because he knows his time's up in some areas and God is moving the church into some things. But we're not going to be able to do it just by what we've done in the past. 
Some things won't change, of course. But God is saying, I want you to come and spend time with me. Just worship me, praise me, love me. And I, some things I'll show you so you can step into them. Other things I will just shift on my own. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. His truth, it says, the truth of the Lord endures forever. He's bringing his mercy, and he's going to establish us in truth. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness. Just bow your head for a minute and close your eyes. Just, just reverence the Lord here for a second. See, I realize that there are times in services, it doesn't happen every service, but there are times when I've been given the privilege of sharing something that's giving a person an opportunity to miss something very bad in their future and step into something very good. And I don't know who that is in this place today, but I do have a sense in my spirit right now, because God doesn't show you everything, but I do have a sense in my spirit right now, there's somebody here that's like that. That you're, you're like I was sitting in that work truck when I was 29. You're at that place where you've denied truth on the inside. You may not have understood truth completely, but you've, you, you knew that there was something you needed to say yes to, and it was the Lord. But you've, you've done what I did. You've played that little religious game in your mind trying to justify yourself or maybe blame other people or whatever, you know, the deception of the day was for you. And God's saying, you're at a place, just like I was at that place, that he can't cover you any longer. Now, he loves you. He is God. And he's able to do exceeding abundantly beyond what we can ask or think. But you have a free will and you have a choice in which pathway in life you're going to go down. God said it through Moses at the end of his life as he spoke out Deuteronomy. He said, I set before you this day life and blessing, death and cursing. And then he said, let me give you a hint. Choose life. When you choose God, I'm not talking about you trying to, you know, perform. I'm talking about you letting God in the door and just saying, Lord, I want to be one of your disciples. I want to follow you with my whole heart. And I, I want you to lead me into the purpose and plan you have for my life. That's called repentance. That's called changing your thinking. That's called changing the pathway. That's turning around from one going down one pathway and going down another. And letting the shepherd of your soul lead you into what he has for you and your family. If you're here today and that's the case in your life, I encourage you, I exhort you, make the decision today. Make the decision today. Don't put it off. Well, I'm young, I'm this, I'm that, or I'm you know, too old for that. No, 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 no. None of that counts. What counts is that God loves you and he's got great things for your life. Better than you could even understand. And when the storms do blow, they're going to come anyway. You might as well be ready for them. You might as well build your house on a rock so you don't get washed away when the storms come. I'm not telling you there's not going to be any more storms. I'm just telling you you'll be able to survive them if you walk with God. And not only survive them, but go forward and thrive in life. And have the peace and the joy and all that you can have in him. So if you're here today and that's you and you know that in your life, maybe you are a Christian. You've already received Christ and you're in his kingdom. <clears throat> but you know you were like me. I received him as a, a young boy, but I wasn't walking with him. For all those years. I was doing my own thing my own way. Wasn't wanting to hear about the call. Wasn't wanting to hear about being a disciple. Maybe that's your, your situation. Or maybe you're here and you've never accepted Jesus. You've never opened your heart and just said, Jesus, I see that you're, uh, you know, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. You came and you came to save me from what, what sin is producing in my life. And going to produce for eternity in my life, which is separation from God for eternity. Yes, my friend, there is a hell. Yes. I know the devil's worked real hard through the media and other ways to try to convince people. And unfortunately, he's even got some Christians convinced there's no hell. Jesus said there is. Right. When he told the story about the rich man in hell, 
He didn't say it was a parable. Every time he told a parable, he said, it's as if or it's like unto. But when he told that story, he said, there was a certain rich man. There is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. So if you're here, God's got a, a good road for you, and he's wanting you to step up and go down that road. He will lead you. You don't have to make it happen. All you have to do is be willing to take the shepherd's hand, listen to the shepherd's voice, and let him lead you into what he has for you. So if you're here and, and you've never done that or you need to pray a prayer of repentance or a prayer of just accepting him, I'm not here to embarrass you or make a spectacle of you. I'm just here to help you. All of us are here to help you. We rejoice in the fact that you're here today or that you're ready to make that step. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, please everyone just do that in respect for people and their personal decisions. If you're here and you need to raise your hand and just let me see your hand so I can agree with you in prayer. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Praise God, yes. Praise God, just listen to your heart. Listen to your heart. You don't have to try to dig up something that's not true, but... The Holy Spirit lives in you. The Holy Spirit's here right now. And one of the things he does is he reveals or convicts us of sin so that we can, he doesn't condemn us. He doesn't tell us you're no good and you're never going to be any good. He convicts us. He says, here's where you're at. We need to get out of this and move into something better. Anyone else want to lift their hand just to show me? Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Okay, everyone in here with me, let's just pray this together. Those of you that lifted your hands, don't just say words. From your heart, speak to God as we agree with you. Just say, Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning. I acknowledge that you are God. I acknowledge that your son came to this earth for me. That he died for me. He was buried for me. He rose from the dead for me. And he is alive for me. I confess him as my Savior and my Lord, not just the one that has saved me, but I submit to his Lordship today. I ask him to lead me, to guide me, and I'm going to do the best I can just to submit to him daily, to fellowship with him. I know I'm not going to be perfect, but I have a sincere, perfect heart. <clears throat> and I thank you that he receives me today, restores me, and begins to work in my life like never before. Now let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for those that lifted their hands. Maybe there were some who didn't lift their hands, but in their heart they sincerely prayed this prayer because you know the hearts of men and women. I pray, God, right now that the divine influence of your spirit would come upon them in a, a supernaturally strong way. Let the wind of the Holy Ghost blow on their life, Father. Let them have, if need be, dreams and visions from you. God, let them encounter you and even your angelic realm in any way they need to. God, I pray that you would uh, help the, the, them remove the people from their life that shouldn't be in their life and that you would bring the people into their life that need to be in their life. God, I pray that you'll begin to watch over them. Help them, help us, Lord, uh, to pray for them, to be there for them in any way we can, to help them to, to walk that pathway that you've given them. And I thank you and I celebrate with them that this is a brand new day. This is a day where a door has been opened for them where they will see the light and the life and the glory of God like they've never seen it before. We thank you for it and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Before we leave, we're going to receive communion together. Go ahead, gentlemen, ladies, pass out the communion, uh, if you would. Now, th the reason we could do what we just did is because of communion, because of the blood and body of the Lord. Jesus gave, there's only one, one person who was totally innocent that died. And that was him. And he said this. He said, no man takes my life from me. I willingly give it. Give it for what? Give it for you and I. Hallelujah. Now, you 
have uh, the privilege, if you're a Christian, you have the privilege of knowing that his blood has cleansed you from all sin. His blood didn't just cover sin so it could be revealed later. The Bible says he purged our sins. As far as God's concerned, now I know this is hard for the human mind to understand, but you, you can get it in your heart if you study the word and let the Holy Spirit show it to you. As far as God's concerned, you've never sinned. I know you have, you know, in time and in the past, but God doesn't look at you based on that. Listen to me. He looks at you in his son. You are now in Christ Jesus. You're one spirit with the Lord. Jesus said in John 17, Father, show them that you love them as much as you love me. The same love God has for the Father has for Jesus is what he has for you. And the Bible says we're joint heirs. We've inherited what Jesus has inherited. We are in him, one with him. Praise God. And the way we became that is because he gave his body and his blood. So it's not about crackers and juice. It's not about, there again, natural blood substance on the ground, even though that was the life of God that was being poured out that day. It's not about the fact that his body was broken or, or whole, either one, but it is a fact that he paid the price. He took upon himself what was going to come upon us for eternity so that we could have what he had. It's an exchange. He says, give me your broken, busted, and disgusted life, and I'll give you my life, my eternal life. Praise God. So if you're here today and you're sick, you can get well right now as you receive this, not because of the juice, but because of what it represents. You can receive the life of God that comes to you through what he did for you. Amen. You can receive. I had a friend that was dying of leukemia, and he <clears throat> was an usher in the church, and one morning as he was so weak he didn't even go to church, and finally one morning he just had a witness in his heart he needed to go, so he, his wife drug him to church basically. And some of the ushers didn't know that he, he was sick, I guess. They asked him to help with communion, and he thought, help with communion? I feel like crawling under the pew right now and just laying down. But he forced himself to get up, and he took the communion elements, and he said as he would go down the aisle, he would lean on the pew and hand them off, and then he'd go to the next one and lean on it because he was so weak. And he said when he finally got it all handed out and he was standing with the other ushers and he had his communion cup, he said, I looked down in my communion cup and he said, when I did, I had a supernatural encounter with God. He said, the words appeared in my communion cup. A scripture appeared and said, by his stripes, you are healed. God was saying that what this symbolizes is where your healing's at. The price has been paid. And he said, Lord, I accept that. From that day forward, he began to get stronger and stronger. He went to the doctor a few weeks or a month or whatever later. And when he walked in the doctor's office, he said, the doctor said, what has happened to you? Because his color had changed. He was stronger. They did tests on him. The doctor said, you don't have leukemia in your body anymore. Amen. Now, I gave that testimony to you because I'm telling you the same thing can happen for you. You don't have to see the same thing he saw in the cup. You just have to know by his stripes you're healed. That's how God sees it. So, Father, as we come before you this morning, we thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you for each other. We are that corporate body, and we're to treat one another the way we would treat Jesus. And so we thank you for our brothers and sisters, the ones that are in this building, the ones that are across this earth. We bless them in Jesus' name. We ask you to help them to walk in the fullness of what you have for them. And Lord, we thank you that even though your body was whole and you touched every kind of communicable disease on earth while you were here in ministering healing, you were never broken, but you allowed your body to be broken so that our body could be made whole, so that the body of Christ could be whole in one accord. We honor you in that this day, and we receive that, and we commit ourselves to it in Jesus' name. You may receive the body together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that brokenness is healed. In your brokenness, we are made whole. Brokenness, anything broken in the lives of your people today, I say it's healed and well and made whole. Broken marriages made whole in Jesus' name.
Broken minds or souls made whole. Anything that's broken, Father, we thank you that it's made whole. And Lord, we thank you for your blood, <laughs> your life. The word says that in him was life, and the life was the light of men. We thank you that we have in our spirits, as we are born again, your life and nature, your DNA. And this cup reminds us that that life, that as we do what Jesus told the disciples, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. That as we drink this little cup this morning, symbolizing what's in us already, we receive the life, the law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that's made us free from the laws of sin and death. We receive that life in our spirit, our soul, our body, our social relationships, our finances. We receive your life and your blood in Jesus' name. You may receive together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now give him praise for it. Thank him. Thank him. This is the year of praise. Give him praise for it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We celebrate you. We celebrate who you are to us and who you are in us and what you're doing through us to help others, what you're doing for us and our families. Hallelujah. You are good, Lord, and your mercies are forever. Amen? Amen. As soon as, if, pass the cups to the aisles, if you would, as soon as they're done picking them up, we're going to do one more thing before we dismiss you today. We're going to receive an offering. We do this once a month after we receive communion on the first Sunday of each month. And this offering goes into a fund called a harvest fund, which it, we help people that have needs. Maybe they need gasoline, they need diapers for their baby. We, uh, once a, uh, a week on Thursday, we give out about 30 boxes of food in connection with the food bank. We pay for 15 of those boxes. So part of this offering goes to that. So this is an offering that's almsgiving is what it is in the Bible to help people who are having some kind of struggle or some kind of natural need, either in, in the church here or outside of the church. And so uh, just lift your hand if you want an offering envelope for that. Just pray and obey. Do whatever the Lord tells you to do concerning that. And uh, every need will be met. Amen? Yeah. Praise God. There's been times, up front here, Jim, there's been times when we've handed money to somebody and I've watched their eyes go from darkness to light. Go from hopelessness to hope. You have no idea. Maybe you do. I don't know. How one box of food or even a little bag of diapers can just give somebody hope. There, are, there is somebody out there. And we always try to tell them, it's not us. It's him. It's his goodness through us that's doing this for you. And we try to lead them to Christ if we can or pray for their sickness or whatever if they need it. <clears throat> so this is just an, an extension of you into the community. Yeah. Storehouse, I'm sorry. I said harvest. Well, it, it is harvest now, but storehouse is what you put in. That's all right. Every envelope that comes in this offering will make sure it will go to that anyway. Praise God.